So the Godot 4 Alpha is out and it is the ideal time to get started, especially picking up 3D if it's not something you've touched before, because Godot 4 adds an exceptional amount to the 3D side of the engine to make it much more competitive with the other real rivals like Unity and Unreal. There are a bunch of really cool things that can make your games look very nice. So I have a video already that covers a few of the key changes that you'll come across if you try to write in the new version of GD Script to go with Godot 4, and now I wanted to cover a few of the key hurdles and useful additions to know about when you're dealing with the 3D side of things. So to start with, there is a key change to the way world environments and default environments work that will affect your ability to get creating a scene and started right away. So originally in Godot 3, there were default environments that were added to your scene automatically, and whenever you ran a scene, if there was no world environment in it, it would use that default environment, and that told it how to render the 3D world around you, and what part of the screen to shade what way. So now the world environment isn't included anymore. When you add a camera to your scene and you try running it, nothing's going to output. So let's go to a new scene, let's create a 3D scene, add a camera, and let's just set it to current and try running. And we can see we get an output that looks a lot like a blank 2D canvas. So with the default environment being gone, they've moved a bunch of those options to the top of the viewport. If I go back here, there are two buttons that have new functionality. There's this toggle preview environment button, and there's one to the right of it for adding default sun and environment options. So if I click the preview button, you'll see exactly what's happening when we run our scene. And it's that it's rendering without the preview environment. When you're in the editor, it has this preview that is distinct from the old default environment in that it's not actually in our world, it's only in the editor. But we can add a version of this environment to our game. And that's all done in those three vertical dots to the right of it. Here we can add a default environment and a default sun to our scene, the same one that's in the editor right there, and we can also customise it. You can just fiddle with it to your heart's content, you can add ambient occlusion, you can add global illumination, whatever you want, and whenever you're done fiddling with all of this, you can add that environment to your scene. And we can also add that sun to our scene, and we will get this directional light and we will get this world environment. Now when we run our scene, it will have access to the environment and it will actually render. So that is an extra step when you want your game to actually output when you're in 3D, but it does simplify the 2D experience, it also makes the default environment a lot easier to edit and a lot easier to choose the core options you want when you're setting it up. So now we know about that, I can focus on some of the cooler world environment additions that are added for Godot 4. So if we go to this world environment that was just added, there are a few fold-out options that simply weren't present before, but the coolest of them is SDFGI. This is Sign Distance Field Global Illumination, and it was funded by the Epic Mega Grant, or at least research into it was, and it's a very novel new approach to handling global illumination that is a real fighting reason to use Godot going forwards in a 3D environment. If I go over to my other demo over here, I have Sign Distance Field Global Illumination set up, and it makes the objects in the environment look a lot more like they actually fit in the world, and it makes this ambient occlusion around the edge a lot starker. So how do I set that up? Well, to start with, we go to the SDFGI dropdown and we check Enabled. From there, we can also enable occlusion and reading the skylight, to make it better reflect the environment settings we've already got. I tend to just add those when I'm running. Now if we add some meshes, like a plane, and a sphere, we can get on to the next step, which is all the objects you want to use, sign distance field global illumination, you need to set their global illumination mode to static. What that means is that the engine will build its sign distance field from all the objects that have been labeled as static. So if I click the drop down here, you'll see it even says SDFGI as one of the prompts next to static. And if you want the fidelity of the effect to be greater, you can increase the light map scale. I've been very happy with the 
visual fidelity I've been able to achieve using this SDFGI as well as a little bit of anti-aliasing. I've just been very happy with how things have been looking. There are two more things I want to look at, the first of which is the reworked mesh importer. I've got some GLTF files from KKIT. If you double click on them, now there is a importer menu. Uh, this gives you a preview of the model you're importing. It also lets you see the individual meshes involved as well as the materials attached to them. So that's all nice, but the key cool thing this does in my eyes is this generate physics option. So say you've got a scene that you want to be a ball and it looks like a ball, and what you would normally do is you drag that into your scene, extract the mesh, create a physics body from it, add the physics body and the mesh as a child of a rigid body node, and then you'd have the ball you can move around. That process is now automated. There's this generate physics option. If you click on that, you then get a default body type and options to control how the collision shape will be created. So we can choose from three body types. One important thing to note here is that rigid bodies are now called dynamic bodies. Kinematic bodies are also called character bodies, but you can't make a character or kinematic, whichever one you want to call it, body from this menu. You can only make static, dynamic, or area. So we can tell it that we want this mesh to be a dynamic body, and then we can control how we're going to create the collision mesh for that. So at the moment we're dealing with this body, which is quite a complex shape. Uh, we can get a very accurate creation of that if we use tri-mesh. Normally you don't want very accurate collision shapes because actually distinguishing between this bit and this bit usually isn't going to get noticed. So we can make our collisions a lot simpler by decomposing that shape. You can see it uh, has far fewer triangles than the alternative. And depending on what decomposition you go with, if you go with a decomposed complex, this gives you a load of manual options. So you can, for example, normalize it to get extra space around the edge. You get quite a lot of control over how this collision shape is going to look and behave. And now if you re-import it, and if I instance that scene, we make it local so we can see the parts of it. We can see that we have a rigid body character merchant. We have a rigid body backpack, and that backpack has a collision shape, and it's that simplified one that we created ourselves. So just with careful use of that, you can reduce a lot of the repeated behavior you'd have to go through when you're setting up a lot of these scenes yourself. So as I was mentioning earlier, it also lets you see all the meshes you're importing, which probably makes this a good time to bring up the new changes to materials. If we go into standard material, there's a few sensible changes and a few new options entirely. So there used to be a fold-out menu called flags at the top with a bunch of generic options. That's gone. All their components are moved into sensibly named locations. But also there are some things that just weren't here before. If we go into transparency, we can check no depth test. You used to have to do this in shaders. That's very useful because it means the object will always draw even if it's through another mesh. Let's go there. You can see we can see it even though we're through a mesh. The benefit of that is if you want to create something like an x-ray shader or like a detective vision or whatever where you want to see an object through a wall. You can just do that. It's pretty cool. So those are a bunch of key changes to handling 3D elements in Godot 4 in the editor. There's an awful lot more to talk about that I haven't yet that will have to be in other videos, particularly a bunch of new unique nodes that have been added that give you access to a lot of really cool behavior. For example, uh, having particles with physics just natively, that's really cool. Having those individual bits of volumetric fog, just a bunch of cool stuff. Anyway, this has been an introduction to doing 3D stuff in Godot 4. Have fun, uh, it was a pleasure, cheers.